Welcome to Weave Along with Eloise. I'm Eloise of Finchingfield. Before we get into the tablet weaving, I wanted to address a question that I've seen a couple of times in the comments, which is, why are they digging up graves? Graves are only one place that an archaeologist will excavate. They'll also carefully, diligently, respectfully sift through former homes, farmsteads, churchyards, garbage dumps, and cesspits. Their job is to piece together human history and prehistory, learning about their lives through the shape of their homes and the layout of their villages, their places of worship, the contents of their pantries, and indeed their toilets, the types of ceramics they used, the ornamentation that they wore or treasures that they kept, the animals that they raised, the clothing that they wore, and so much more. And this is largely done by excavating not only their properties where they lived, but also the tombs and burial sites. Because humans have a long history of burying their loved ones with things that were important to them or are important to their community. And in some cases, important in the afterlife for whatever faith they believed in. And all of these objects can tell archeologists a lot about how people lived. But then the question becomes, is it science or thievery? Well, some people find that there's a fine line between grave robbing and archeology, span but really what it comes down to is that archeologists use these materials to learn more about the people. What they uncover can teach us about how people lived. Whereas grave robbers are simply in it for the money. They're motivated exclusively by selling the things that they find to make a profit. So essentially, if you've gotten permission from the government offices to do a dig and those items that you find are stored properly and preserved for the future, it's archeology. span If you're breaking into somebody's yard in the cover of darkness, digging up stuff to sell, it's grave robbing. A number of tombs in Egypt were robbed within days or even hours after the tomb was sealed up. People would break in, knowing where the tomb was, with the freshly embalmed pharaoh inside, steal all the treasure, melt it down, and sell it for profit. Which is why a number of the Egyptian tombs that are opened up are empty. And it was a huge deal when King Tut's tomb was opened up and the treasure was still there. The contents of his tomb have been carefully preserved and occasionally go on tours around different countries. I was lucky enough to see one of the collections as it toured through Seattle a few years ago. It was amazing. If you have an opportunity to go see some of the King Tut's tomb treasures, I highly, highly recommend you do so. There's a great movie on Netflix right now called The Dig and it's about the Sutton Hoo discovery in Suffolk, England. It uh, takes place at the dawn of World War II. It's a true story. Um, you can completely ignore the goofy love story that's kind of a side thing. I mean, that was just thrown in for modern audiences anyway, right? It's, yeah, we're all here for the history and archeology. span Who cares about the love story? Just like King Tut's tomb, the Sutton Hoo burial was unique in that all of the treasure was still there. It contained a huge hoard of artifacts that really details the life of 7th century Anglo-Saxons. All these pieces are on display at the British Museum, and it is definitely a bucket list location for me. The piece I'm showing you today is another one of those kinds of grave finds. It dates to the 11th century and was found in Latvia. The garment, whatever this thing is, because I had difficulty translating again, was made out of dark blue wool and was decorated with tablet weaving, and the ends had some little brass rings on it. I'm not sure if they were closures for something, or if they were decorative. It was really kind of hard to tell from the picture. The grave was found in Pridneki, Latvia, near the Daugava River, and it contains the remains of a man from the Salonian tribe. Now, this was a tribe of people that lived right on the border between present-day Latvia and Lithuania. Not much is known about this Baltic tribe, except that they had been around since about the first millennium AD, and they lived on both sides of that Daugava River. But around the sixth or seventh century, they were only living on the left bank. And by the late Iron Age, they had been at least partially absorbed by the Latgalian people. The Salonian tribe was completely gone by the 13th century when they agreed to be Christianized and ruled by the German people. The pattern I'm gonna show you today is another skip hole weave, and it can be done in either two or three colors. The original apparently was done in three colors, but most of the recreations that I've seen have been done in two colors. So feel free to add a third color if you choose. As part of the Laurel Kingdoms project, today's project is celebrating the Kingdom of Trimeris, which was founded in 1985. It's made up of Florida and Panama, but it also lays claim to Antarctica. 
much to the consternation of the kingdom of Lokok, who claimed it first. And in case you're wondering, the kingdoms don't just war over lands. The kingdom of Anstiora claimed the International Space Station. But not to be outdone, the kingdom of Trimeris sent one of their symbols, a Triskela, up with a space shuttle. So they now claim space. This is turning into medieval Star Wars. But of course, the characters in Star Wars already wore cloaks and tunics, so we were halfway there already. This is like art imitating life, imitating art. Something like that. The colors of Trimeris are blue and white. So let's get our looms and let's get started. Alrighty, we are ready to do the warping. Of course, you need to have all your materials ready. You gotta have your scissors and 16 cards, your pattern, which by the way, this pattern, the repeat is only half. I doubled it so I could see the whole pattern as it repeats, but the pattern is actually 12 picks, not 24. But it is a very simple threading diagram like many of the Skipple weaves. Two colors. I've got my loom. I've got the peg in the far back position. I've got my lazy tape with my two colors in it. And I've got my mandatory cup of tea. So we're going to move the thread onto the floor. We'll only need blue for the first couple. Let's scoot this back. Uh, oh, and then roll up the sleeves. All right, now I can work. All right, card number one is four threads of blue. You leave a long tail, about three or four inches. Pinch it against that front peg and feed it all the way through all of the pegs, back and forth, top to bottom, or however your uh, threading diagram recommends. Some of these ankle looms, you uh, thread it at an angle up and down. It's, it all depends on, on who the manufacturer is and, and how it was designed. Second thread, following the same path. Oh, scoot that in. Back to the beginning again. Snip your thread. Third thread. I've had a number of people ask me you know, why I put so many threads on here, or, you know, such a long piece if I'm only weaving a little bit. Now, if you're new to the channel, um, this is one long continuous warp, and as you weave, it will scoot around the pegs, and so all of this will become woven in the end. And I will be sure to include a little clip of how that's done later on in the video. Sounds like Moki's going to be singing for us today. All right, I'm back to using the little plastic cards. Um, I really do like the size of these, um, and they slide really nicely against one another. These ones were 3D printed by my husband. Um, he doesn't have a pattern for them yet. He was still perfecting it, and then he had to go on a long business trip. So he'll get back to it when he has an opportunity. He's just working 14-hour days right now. So... Uh, the cards that are labeled A, B, C, D in a clockwise form will face to the right in this pattern. And these are S threaded. S goes through the back of the card or the left side of the card. So all four threads will go through the back. Pull all four threads taut. You don't want to have any loose threads or you end up with lots of tension issues. And you'll tie this in a surgeon's knot, which is twice around, left over right, and then once right over left. And that is your first card. 
Now again, you want to make sure that the card is facing to the right as you're stacking the cards up. As long as you've threaded it correctly, you can always flip it later. But sometimes I like to just make sure that it's facing the right direction as I'm going. Okay, card number two. Same deal. Pinch it with your thumb. Leave a long tail. And follow the long path. Round and round and round we go. Some of you may be wondering where I was the last couple of weeks. If you follow the channel and follow the, the community comments and and uh, my Facebook page, um, I didn't specify where I was, but I went to Charleston, South Carolina and uh, got to visit with my husband, who is there at the moment, and um, also with my nephew, who lives out there. He's a uh, a sous chef at one of the barbecue restaurants. I won't tell you which one. You just have to try them all. There's a lot, so it could take you a while. But I had a great time visiting with him. Oh, there's a flaw in the thread. Look at that. I wonder if you can see that. That is a massive flaw. I'm just going to snip that off. I do not need that in my work. Luckily, it was only a a little bit. That is probably the first time I've seen a flaw like that in this thread. Maysville makes some really good thread. I haven't had a lot of problems with it. That's a, like I said, the first time. Oh, this thread just fell off. Come back here. Okay. So, card number two, again, you're going to face it to the right. And it's Z-threaded, which will go through the front of the card. This one popped off of there too. Okay, so gather up all of your threads again. Make sure that they're all pulled snug. And scoot them back so they're all lined up. Make sure it's not caught on the foot of this room. Surgeon's knot. And scoot all the threads back. Alrighty. Tea break. Tea. Earl Grey. Hot. Delicious. Okay, now we're doing two threads at a time. So I have one red. Or not red. What am I talking about? One blue and one white. Honestly, I am not colorblind. Pinch, and you can do two threads at the same time. Keep them separated by keeping your finger between them so they don't twist as you're warping. By the way, this pattern is twist neutral, so you won't have to deal with twist buildup except on your border cards, which if you flip every three or four repeats of the pattern, should be just fine. All right, so the rest of these cards until the end are all S-threaded. So we're going to go through the back of the card for each one of these. And B is the white thread. And D is the blue thread. And there's only two threads on each card. 
So this warping will go really pretty fast. So one thing I really like about these skip hole patterns, not only are they super cool because most of them are double sided, but they're really fast to, to warp up. Card number four, same thing. A is white, and directly across, diagonally, is blue. So all the cards will be threaded that way. If you get the, the first thread into the correct hole, the other one is directly across from it. and the rest of the cards will be threaded up the same way. Getting started with the next phase of weaving will require just a few tools. Of course, you need your warped up loom, you need a fully loaded shuttle, you need your pattern, a pencil, and optionally a cup of tea or your favorite beverage. Now, as I mentioned in the introduction, this pattern is actually repeated. So the number of picks is only 12. I'm going to post the shorter version on my blog so you don't have to worry about that. Okay, so the first thing you need to do is line up all of your cards so that A, D are at the top. And because this is a skip hole weave, the cards will tend to twist on their own accord. So you'll need to move them into position. One back, one forward, one back, one forward, one back, one forward. And then these two. And also, it looks like one of the cards has gotten tangled up in the next one. Ah, there we go. So once your cards are all lined up, I'm going to make sure that none of the cards are tangled around each other. Oop, that one turned. And that one turned. And the rest look okay. So, get them all lined up. 
and stick the pencil in the hole just to hold them in place for the moment. As you weave along, they will kind of squirrel around a little bit less, particularly if you have the tension just right. But for now, they're all over the place. I'm going to back up the tension just a hair. So you take your shuttle and you'll pull the tail through the shed and nestle it in about two fingers width from the bottom. Just leave that little bit of space. I always start with my shuttle on the left because um, when I'm done, I can stick it under that piece of elastic that'll hold it onto the frame so that if I need to pick up the loom and move it, it's not going to fall on the floor. But that's the only reason. You can do it however you like. So to start, I always turn all the cards forward at least four times and run the shuttle between. So we'll run the shuttle through and then I like to take the tail and stick it back through the shed to create a little knot to anchor it. Turn all the cards forward again. Again, pencil. Run the shuttle through. Cards forward again. Run the shuttle through. And now we can start tightening up all of the threads. You want it snug. You don't want to get it too tight. Turn the cards forward once more, and AD are back up at the top again. We'll press the weft down. And now we've done one full revolution. All right, so now we're ready to start our pattern. Um, if it's easier, you can get a, a ruler and you can follow along line by line. Um, like many skip hole weaves, this is going to repeat. So lines one and two are the same, three and four are the same, five and six are the same. Um, this is very typical for a skip hole weave. So we're gonna follow the pattern. Cards one through six are gonna go forward. So two, four, six. Cards seven and eight are gonna go backwards. So we'll slide those two cards back. Nine and 10 will go forwards. 11 through 14 will go backwards, and then the border cards will go forwards. So we're going to turn the backwards cards backwards, forwards cards forwards, and then I will stick the pencil back in. And that's how I tend to hold the cards so that the bottom cards don't twist while I'm weaving. And I'm going to get the other thread out of the way so we don't get it tangled up and then like I said everything is done in pairs so I'm going to turn those same cards backwards forwards cards forwards use the pencil to hold things in place press pull the loop and then leave a loop behind pick number three Cards one through eight will go forward. So two, four, six, eight. And then the other cards will go backwards, except for the border cards. Turn the backwards backwards, forwards forwards. Press your weft down. Pull that loop and then leave the loop behind and repeat. Press, pull the loop, and leave the loop behind. All right. In row number five, or pick number five. These two go backwards. These four will go forwards. And four backwards. And four forwards. Pick 
pen, pencil. Repeat. And then pick seven and eight, four forwards, four backwards, four forwards, and two backwards. What I like about some of these patterns, like this one, there's only essentially six different positions. So after a while, you will memorize the pattern and you won't need to have it on hand the whole time. So you'll really get into the groove. The weaving will go really fast and you'll really start to enjoy doing it. And you can have a conversation with people. You could watch a movie while you're doing it. Uh, let's see. So cards three through eight is that right three through eight backwards and the rest forwards and repeat And then the last one, two, three, four, five, four backward, two forwards, four backwards, two forwards, two backwards, and the rest forwards. And again, and that is such a lovely crisp pattern so far, but of course it's only half the pattern. Seems like we're starting in the middle of the pattern. So all you see is a real, you know, it's an X. So I'm going to do the pattern again, and then you'll be able to see what the full pattern looks like. the full pattern and it looks spectacular now let's see if I can flip it over I'm gonna dial the tension back just a little so we can flip it over and you can kind of see that there's a little bit of definition there that the little dimples kind of disappear but uh, perhaps as we go along that'll become more pronounced but that looks that looks pretty awesome. I like the way that looks. All right. Tighten up the tension again. And we're going to keep on weaving. <laughs> 